Hello, this is 3rd August and I'm Madhusudin Raj, your host. Today we are going to discuss two things. Uh, I know this is a bit late uh, for discussion of the Modi's uh, first budget, but there was nothing new in the budget, so that's why I did not come up with my uh, regular economic analysis of it. But today I want to do you know just you know make few comments on that very quickly, and then we'll be, you know, we'll talk about this uh, WTO uh, trade facilitation uh, pact, which was just kind of blocked by the by the Indian government, by the Indian delegation, uh, uh, on behest of uh, the direct. Uh, kind of uh, directions coming from the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So uh, let's talk about budget first very quickly. As I said that there was nothing new in the economic budget of Modi government. Uh, the main highlight of this budget was that they increased the military spending by something like 12% uh, or so 1.5 lakh crore rupees. They are now <coughs> allocating to the military expenditure and this is what this is what we are seeing since the coronation of uh, Mr. Modi, since he took the uh, position of a prime minister of this country. His main focus is on defense expenditure, basically. I think he inaugurated the uh, one of the naval ship also just after taking the oath and he's basically very much interested in the military spending. So uh, I don't know whether you know, we require this. Uh, the thing is that uh, whether the question is whether we need all this military spending or not. The thing is that uh, society as a whole will have to ultimately decide where they want to use their resources because uh, in a country like India where more than 35 crore people are living less than one and a half dollar or two dollar a day, basically they are living into abject poverty where they don't have enough food to eat, where they don't have clothes in their bodies, they don't have you know ceiling on their head. In, in this kind of a country, in this kind of a situation, we have to make our priorities very clear that whether we want to spend, you know, we in this sense, the government who is using taxpayers' money, whether we as a society as a whole, we want to tax, you know, we want to spend our precious resources on uh, manufacturing guns and tanks and rockets and missiles and warships and warplanes, etc., etc., or we want to use those resources, resources for producing bread and butter for the mass population who is hungry for for production of electricity where you know most of the people are living in the dark for for manufacturing producing toilets for people potable water you know food for example so as a society we have to prioritize thing and it looks like that this government is very much focused on military spending uh, uh, it's not very surprising for those people who know, know the nature of the state because as the great American journalist, uh, beginning of the 20th century, he wrote in his article, unfinished article, the state uh, that the war is the health of the state. So obviously, the state, you know, aka the government, is very much interested in waging wars in the name of defending the country. Uh, so they are saying that we are being threatened from all the fronts. You now on this side we have Pakistan, on the other side the China is also increasing its military spending, Chinese government basically, not the people. So that's why they also have to spend you know, a lot of money on military. India is I think number one importer of the arms in the world right now. But as I say, do we really need this kind of defense, what we call defense expenditure? Or do we need this kind of military expenditure? And I don't have time right now to go and discuss whether national defense is actually a reality or a myth. Uh, but I will, you know, say very quickly that we don't need national defense. You know, there are many alternative, you know, alternatives available to uh, having, you know, standing army and having this national defense. For example, we can have citizens in militia. We can have guerrilla fighters. We can have private insurance companies providing defense services. For example, where they are needed. Uh, but as I said, in this economic analysis, I don't want to focus on private means of security production that may be for later on. Right now, I'm saying that the Modi government is very much focused on military spending. So, uh, taxpayers' resources are used into producing guns and tanks and bombs and bullets instead of producing bread and butter. And ultimately, we have to know that all these guns and tanks and you know, bullets are going to be used in waging wars only. And wars are not good for anyone. 
doesn't matter who is going to win, war is ultimately going to create destruction only. People are going to get killed on both sides, you know, there is no enemy out there, you know, this is a battle, this is a war between two governments who are trying to expand their territories. So basically in their fighting, innocent civilians are going to die and ultimately we are going to face destruction. So when you are manufacturing all these, you know, bombs and guns and tanks, you would want to ultimately use it in wars and as I said, war is not good for any one of us. So that's why, again, the focus is not there, which was very much expected. And as I said, even if they'll try to do something, they won't be able to. Uh, they have kept their uh, uh, fiscal deficit target to what the UPA government did. And I don't think so they are going to meet their target. But in any case, uh, and already the finance minister, Jaitley, is saying that it's, it is a tough task to meet that particular target. Second thing, they lifted some kind of, uh, they lifted the FDI limit from some percent to 49% in the insurance sector. But again, the question is, do we need any kind of government control into all these areas? Even, you know, if we go by the minimum government argument, then government's job is to protect the livelihood and property of its citizens. So, uh, that's it. That is what they'll have to do, the police state, you know, concept. And apart from that, they don't have any say in insurance sector or in any other sector but any case they are very heavily involved into that so that is about the budget analysis there was nothing new what we have the budget is just a proposal you know uh, these are proposed figures we have to see actual actions of the Modi government and, and recently the market also crashed and many people are now foreign investors especially after this locket of WTO deal they are getting a bit you know apprehensive about the Modi leadership about Narendra Modi because when he was coming to power people were thinking that he is a free market some kind of free market prime free market oriented prime minister etc etc by the way that was a joke Narendra Modi and free market there is no connection whatsoever but in any case uh, now people are kind of becoming a bit of disillusion and and they are saying and they are they're realizing that they made a mistake of you know pinning so much of hope on this one guy He's just going to play the populist, you know, measures like what he was doing with this WTO deal. So let's talk about that deal bit uh, for a while. Uh, it's it's basically Bali agreement, trade facilitation agreement, where they wanted to, you know, kind of streamline the customs rules and allowing the market access and removing the agricultural subsidies and stockpiling of the food stock, etc., etc. But as I say, uh, ultimately the Modi government blocked it. And the reason they gave for this blockage was that they want to basically help the poor people and they want to work on for the uh, for the betterment of the national government. They want to work for the betterment, betterment of national interests. You know, Modi was saying that and his, uh, uh, his commerce minister was saying that we blocked this WTO deal because we want to help the poor farmers and we want to uh, uh, further the national interest. Uh, look, you know, I don't, I don't believe in WTO World Trade Organizations, and it's and it's not a free market institution for sure. It's basically a globalist institution, which most of the time the Western governments are using to you know, have control over everything. So I don't, I don't, you know. I'm not saying that I'm a big, you know, kind of supporter of WTO, but let, let's let put aside this trade facilitation pact and Bali agreement, etc. Let's talk about free foreign trade, for example. Suppose if, if we advise Narendra Modi to open up the borders and, you know, have free foreign trade with everybody, even then I'm sure they're going to, you know, f you know, put forward the same arguments that that's not feasible because that is what is going to hurt the poor people and that will not be in the national interest of this country but but is it true basically you know let's say that suppose this WTO deal was about free foreign trade and in that case definitely Narendra Modi and his you know views whatever advisors are advising him that those views are absolutely wrong we have to understand that you know giving subsidies to the farmers and stockpiling all this food grain into the government you know warehouses is this, these are our protectionist policies and protectionism is never going to help the poor people. Protectionism is never going to further the national interest, whatever that nat national interest is. Uh, what is going to further the national interest and what is going to help the poor pe people is the free foreign trade. You know, allowing the uh, buyer and the consumer to trade freely, not only domestically but also internationally. 
So whenever government you know gets in between buyers and the sellers, producers and the consumers, they hurt both the buyer and the seller. So similarly, the Modi government and Andhra Modi, if he himself is very much behind this particular decision, then he's hurting all these millions of poor people in this country. Because uh, protectionism is never going to help poor people. Protectionism is not going to basically make India stronger if India, whatever that concept is, if, if, if the Indians are going to become stronger, if their standard of living is going to rise, and if we think that that is national interest, then that is going to be fulfilled by the free foreign trade, the laissez is fair policy, right? Not by following this kind of protectionist measure. Again, I'm saying that I'm not a supporter of WTO and whatever was into this trade facilitation pact. I'm not much concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is having free foreign trade on the one side and having protectionist policies on the other side. And as I said, if we assume that WTO is kind of representation of free foreign trade, then obviously, uh, which it is not in a way, but as I said, that if you replace WTO with free foreign trade policy, even then, very likely that Modi will say no to that, you know, saying that because they are playing populist policies, you know, they know that uh, uh, state elections are coming up, so they want to woo the village, you know, rural voters and farmers and everybody. So that's why they, they want to keep going on all these agricultural subsidies and stockpiling over the food grain in the government warehouses where it actually roots. Uh, it, it doesn't get out and help the poor people kind of, you know, remove their hunger. It's, it's rotting into, into the government warehouses. So we have to understand uh, this whole discussion into that particular perspective. Uh, protectionism on the one side and the free foreign trade on the other side. And the Modi government is for the protectionism and that definitely is wrong. They should be for the free foreign trade because free foreign trade is going to help the poor people. And free foreign trade is going to basically further the national interest also. Alright, so I think this is what I want to discuss very quickly today with you. And, uh, you know, as I said, Modi government is finishing around two months of its, you know, uh, rain, 15th August is coming, so he's going to deliver his, you know, uh, 15th August speech or whatever. Nothing concrete he has done so far. They have just started this, you know, he was in Brazil for this BRICS, you know, conference. And BRICS nation and nations have just decided to start their own uh, World Bank, you know, and, and which is, you know, the whole idea of having a World Bank is actually, actually uh, very much, you know, stupid because uh, the whole whole issue is that I can understand that they want to show to the Western governments that they are also desperate to you know have their say into the international affairs and they are not getting that. That's why they have created this institution. But as I said, you know, one side the old World Bank, one World Bank is not doing its work properly. So what is the reason of creating another World Bank? That that doesn't make any makes any sense actually. If World Bank one World Bank fail, then the second BRICS World Bank is also going to fail in the long run ultimately. What we actually need is not a World Bank, no central bank. What we need is free market, free foreign trade. We need to have if we have a free market capitalism you know, all over the world, for example, free foreign trade, then obviously people will automatically adopt gold and silver as their currencies and gold and silver, gold and silver standard is the international monetary standard. It used to be international monetary standard. We did not, we, did, we don't need dollar or yuan or rupee as an international currency. Uh, gold was uh, international monetary standard, you know, before they basically went off it, you know, in the beginning of the First World War. So, as I said that this creation of this World Bank is not actually going to help anyone. It's just a that's just a kind of a symbol of the discontent of all these developing countries against the Western world. Uh, so I think uh, it, it will not work in the long run. All right. So in any case, I think uh, this much is enough for today. You know, as I said, uh, we see you know what Narendra Modi is going to do. People are saying that we should not start criticizing him. You know, straight away. Let's like giving him some, like giving him some, give him some time. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very much prepared to give him time, let's say, you know, give him six months, let, let's give him one month, uh, one year, or let's say give him five years also, and I, I, I'm telling you that he will, not, he will not be able to do anything because it's, it's an economic problem. Central planning is a failure as long as he's, he's trying to micromanage the economy, nothing is going to happen, and he will try to micromanage the 
economy because he is that kind of he has that kind of mentality of keeping everything up to him. He's kind of you know, great centralizer. Doesn't like decentralization. So in any case, you know, those who are making this kind of argument, I want to give them the benefit of doubt, and you know. Uh, we just have to see how he's going to fail, you know, in one after another action or phase. But in any case, you know, at that that as the thing is, you know, kind of unfolding, I'm here. I'm going to analyze everything. All right. So this much for today is enough. Uh, I'm going to see you later on. Thank you very much for watching me. Good night.